right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on navigating insurance in the new normal, where we will be getting expert perspectives on your asset insurances amidst COVID-19. Thank you for taking time um, out to be here today. All right, so as COVID-19 becomes increasingly widespread, it's not only raises fears about the well-being of the general public, but it, also, but it is also very disrupting to business operations and creating numerous um, insurance exposures. COVID-19 has led to several business interruptions, supply chain issues, and significant liability concerns. As such, it is very important for companies to understand how COVID-19 can impact the insurance policies. We need to review our existing coverage and determine what precautions we need to take in order to control our losses. Whereas we at Zamara realize that asset insurance is a wide topic, we have narrowed down our discussion to address the pressing issues that have been brought about uh, by our very own clients. Before I continue, I have a few housekeeping rules. Um, number one, we intend to exhaustively answer any questions that you may have. Please make use of a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Secondly, we will also be conducting a 60 second survey that will enable us flow into every segment of the webinar. Your participation is very invaluable. In case you're unable to, to attend the entire session, we would relish um, and would relish watching this. We want you to share this with others, but allow me to mention that we will share this recording on YouTube within 48 hours. Please ensure you also like us on our social media pages so that you never miss out on our events. My name is Rosalind Mugo. I am the Managing Director of Zamara Risk. My role revolves around giving strategic direction to a very dynamic team on creating innovative insurance solutions that meet the needs of the customer. Allow me to introduce my expert panel that is made up of some of the industry greats. Uh, we have Sandeep Baduri, um, Sandy holds a master's in business administration. He has a degree from University of Bradford in the UK. He's presently the CEO and principal officer of GA Insurance, which is the largest fire industrial insurer and generating the highest profit before tax in the Kenyan market. His work experience spans over 15 years covering all facets of short-term insurance across India. He is also involved in the build-up of three startup insurance companies, including two in non-English uh, speaking countries in Africa. The one thing that is very interesting about Sandy that most people do not seem to know is that he speaks Portuguese, Hindi, and Bengali. He's also an avid reader of non-fictional books, a movie buff. He likes trekking. Something that might interest the ladies is that he's very good at cooking. And he loves his music. The one thing that, is also st that also stands out when it comes to Sandeep is that he loves his coffee more than most. Welcome, Sandeep. Walter Orato. Thank you. University of Nairobi with a BCom, MBA at Moy University, a PhD from Moy University. His work experience spans over 20 years as a broker and underwriter in Kenya and East Africa, specialist in, uh, in product development, underwriting, and recruitment. He's also the pioneer in travel insurance sales and marketing in Kenya using alternative distribution channels. 
He's currently at the College of Insurance in Kenya, specializing in marketing, entrepreneurship, and communication. He's also an independent insurance practitioner specializing in SMEs. The one thing that most people would find interesting about Walter is that he's a melancholic, a very family-oriented person who prefers old school and who prefers to deal with characters whose moral compass always points to the true north. At grassroots, uh, grassroots level, he's a chairman of board of management at his local primary school and involved in a program that keeps the standard eight candidates continue, continued engaged in matters academic. Welcome, Walter. Thanks, Rosalind. Last but not least, we have Caroline Leichena, who's an insurance professional and currently the CEO of Sunlam General Insurance Limited in Kenya. She is a chartered insurer of the Chartered Insurance Institute. She holds a master's degree in business administration and a bachelor's degree in commerce from University of Nairobi. She has over 20 years experience in the insurance industry and vast experience in vast in, um, in operations and deep understanding of underwriting in reinsurance and claims management. Prior to joining Sunlam, Caroline served as general manager at Saham Assurance Company. She has also held other senior managerial roles in the industry. The one thing that we do not know, most people do not know about Caroline is that she is a church elder. Shocking but true. <laughs> All right. To get us into this first segment, we will begin by conducting a 60 second survey. Right? So I will have my team put that up and then we will kick us off in the, that will kick us off in the new segment. On your screen is our agenda today. We are going to address four parts that are related to asset insurances. One, we want people to um, delve into the question, are we really covered? Next, we want to redefine our insurance policy. We want to talk about the new face of the insurance industry and we need to move from evidence to action. Sorry. All right, so in this first part, we asked how safe do we feel working from our business premises, working away from our business premises in light of the pandemic? And a good number of people said somewhat safe. Uh, we have 4% saying they're very unsafe and um, a good chunk of people who say they're somewhat unsafe. All right, so to kick us off, 
I will welcome the panel to give us a quick overview of their experience when it comes to matters asset insurance during this season. And then we can get into the question and answer session. All right, I'll start with you, Walter. Thank you. Uh, Rosaline, uh, and my experience uh, during this uh, COVID season has been uh, on its head uh, by and large uh, because it has been a bit challenging to want to go visit your clients with a mask or a hood on. And yeah. sometimes you meet your client right on the door and he or she is unable to recognize you. That has been quite a big challenge, uh, but dealing with clans online has been one of the most exciting experiences that I've had. So for me, COVID has come with mixed bags, uh, silver lining, but also some gloomy sections of it. At the college, it has been an exciting moment because I have had to deliver content from right where I'm sitting. And it has been very interactive, very, very, very engaging. So good to a large measure, uh, but to some insignificant extent. All right, thanks, Walter. Caroline? Um, thank you, Rosa. Um, my experience in this period is that uh, I think everyone was caught by this by surprise. Um, nobody expected that uh, such a scenario would occur. I think when we all moved into 2020, we were very happy to have a happy new year 2020. Yeah. And we were upbeat, and uh, just before we finished even quarter one, uh, the thing struck, and it's been quite an experience. Uh, I've watched customers go through very distressing moments because they are not very sure what happens to their businesses. Their businesses are not doing well. We've had the economy with uh, operating um, below capacity, especially because of the raft of measures that the government has put in place to protect the public. So we have quite a bit of an anxious moment that we have seen in the last three months of the COVID uh, period. And um, curious questions coming from customers. I hope we'll be able to address most of those questions in this, uh, in this webinar. Uh, that's basically my experience. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Caroline. Sandeep? Yeah, uh, this COVID situation actually has been very unprecedented. Uh, so one of the the issues what we faced is that at Caroline and Walter had already mentioned is, you know, our interaction with the clients. Now, what has happened is that now virtual meetings have become the norm of the day. So, and this is to be much more exhausting <laughs> than the physical meetings because you have got one meeting or the other lined up uh, one another because, you know, now you are saving on the commutation portion. So, uh, this is turn turning out to be uh, much more exhausting. Uh, from an insurance technical point of view, you know, there are certain lines of business since the, uh, since, uh, you know, this is an unprecedented situation, we didn't incorporate. And I think as an industry, we didn't incorporate the risk associated with COVID into our pricing. So that's, uh, so we, we'll, uh, you know, we'll wait to see in the next three months, which we think it would be very crucial uh, in terms of how the situation actually unfolds and uh, how the industry behaves and how the industry corrects itself um, going forward, especially next 90 days is going to be very crucial. All right, thank you, Sandeep. So one thank of the you. most frequently asked questions that we have received does relate to liability concerns. A lot of clients would like to know how insurance would respond to guests customers and employees who allege that they became sick due to business negligence. So Walter, I'll, I'll let you take this one. Um, thank you, Rosalind. Uh, generally, uh, most, uh, and I've, as a broker before, I have uh, had a chance to uh, see many, many policies from many insurance companies on liabilities. And I suspect you're talking about public liability here. Uh, the most public liability policies that I've had a chance to look at do not expressly exclude pandemics. So in that case, therefore, uh, there is cover. However, the challenge uh, we have with liability covers is that the person who is alleging to have contracted the client or the person alleging to have contracted uh, the, the disease in your premises will have to prove 
that they actually did contract the disease from your penis. And that, that becomes the, the, the tricky part because it, 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 it is very, extremely difficult for you to prove that you actually got, you know, uh, the, you contracted the disease from your, insure, your, 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 clan's, uh, uh, your clan's penis. But generally, uh, I have hardly come across any PL or public liability policy that excludes um, uh, pandemics. In which case, therefore, if the client is able to prove that they actually contracted the disease, the disease from your premises, then they will be covered. Okay, thank you, Walter. Uh, just to play on that particular point, what are some of the things that we can, um, some of the clauses or some of the ways we can assist our audience and our policyholders when it comes to proving that uh, they actually did contract COVID because of a business negligence? So if you were looking at this situation from the side of a claim, how would you advise our audience? If I was looking at this uh, from the side of a claim, it's, it's a bit tricky because you have to really pin the client down on, you know, your area of suspicion that, you know, uh, the, what makes you believe strongly uh, and convince uh, the court that you actually con uh, contracted this from the client's place. Because, you, you know, in normal life, we don't go about documenting what we do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And from where I sit, uh, and I think I would uh, let the other panelists uh, to jump in, it would be quite an uphill task for the client to prove that, yes, I actually contracted this from your, uh, from your premise. But if they have got, you know, any evidence that would make them actually hold you to it or hold you to yeah. account, that would be uh, a win. All right, Sandeep, do you have anything to say about that? Okay, uh, just to uh, add to what Walter said, actually, you know, uh, the absolute negligence has to be proven. Now, uh, in terms of negligence, there are various kinds of negligence. Now, what uh, what contributes, what how the, uh, you know, the business owner had actually been negligent, it, be, it, 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 it may be a little bit dicey to prove because, you know, again, you have to understand this is a very unprecedented situation. And most of the policies which have been issued, has, the wordings have been, very thinly worded in terms of communicable diseases. Now, in certain cases where I can give you examples uh, where things become very apparent, I think you might be knowing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the thing which happened with cruise ships, actually. So th they were not forthcoming with that particular information and, uh, uh, you know, and there have been incidences. So these actually, so infection or transmission in those kind of a enclosed environment actually makes perfect cases for this kind of, uh, uh, you know, claims. Otherwise, from an insurance point of view, what, uh, you know, the problem with the insurance company faces is that uh, whenever we face a claim, we have to defend it. And if we face a claim, we have to keep up our reserves till the case is closed. So that is where it, it has a direct impact on our profitability and the higher the reserves, lower the profit actually. <laughs> okay. All right, I hear you, Sandeep. So what we are saying is that the burden of proof is totally, uh, dependent on the policy holders and they there's an uphill task when it comes to that burden of proof but should they should they be able to um to prove that there was actually negligence on the part of the business then the claim is payable isn't it yeah it is payable unless and until public liability like the you know presently uh you know the london market association they have actually a lma 52 series of clauses which specifically excludes uh, you know, communicable diseases, virus, spores, molds, even decontamination practices. So now, uh, you know, as you know, the insurance practice in Kenya, we are very much dependent on uh, our reinsurance practice. So uh, we are guided by that. And as a risk management measure, the new policies which we are issuing actually has an exclusion for uh, communicable diseases. All right. Okay. That is well responded to. Caroline, mm -hmm. Um, I'd like you to take this one. So one of the other concerns that is directly related to the impact of COVID has to do with business interruption during this season. So companies have lost revenue and at the same time have had to contend with employee wages, rent, 
and even relocation expenses. Policyholders are very keen to know if this risk has been anticipated by any insurance policy. Also, what would a business interruption policy look like and how can it be remodeled to ensure that it can anticipate the change in risk? Um, Caroline? Yes, thank you, Rosa. Uh, first, I'll talk about the current scenario that we are in and the experience that we, we are going through as an industry. One of the things that, uh, that, that I need to mention is that uh, business interruption policies are not standalone policies. They are policies that are sold alongside a material damage policy. So the material damage policy will normally de 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 define the scope where, of the cover for the assets that are on cover. And the BI, what we call the BI is a business interruption policy, then yeah. responds um, uh, after material damage policy has responded to a loss. So there is a condition that has to be met before the BI policies respond. We may not have the pandemic excluded at the moment as an express exclusion, but there has to be a condition that has to be met before the BI policies respond. So for instance, if I talk about a fire policy, um, say, an uh, say a, a fire policy with that is supported with a BI cover, the material damage uh, element is that uh, fire or any other peril that is covered under the policy must happen. And it must be an admissible loss under the fire under the material damage policy for the BI policy to respond. So that's one of the um, disconnects that we have. And that's why customers think that they have BI policies and therefore because it's, there's a pandemic and their business is interrupted, they need to be covered by insurance. I think that's one explanation that I would want to give to the insuring public, that uh, the BI policies, which, which I think I should keep to business interruption policy as, as, as a name uh, for the yes. sake of uh, the insuring <laughs> public, they, they only respond after the material damage policy has responded and the insurance, insured peril must actually happen and a loss must occur and the loss must be admissible under the material damage policy. Moving forward, um, these are like, like my colleagues have said, this is a scenario we have not seen in the past. Uh, most of the reinsurance uh, treaties that we operate as a market, because we also are insured by reinsurance, most of them exclude pandemics. So it's an exclusion. Um, I, I think in every part of the world, if there are any uh, policies covering them, those are limited policies in the world. But uh, I believe this, this is a scenario that you'll be seeing evolving over time. It's a new need and uh, the market must respond over time. One of the things we do as insurers before we, we confirm cover is that we've got to look at the insurability of a risk. So there are particular parameters that have to be met before then. Insurers and reinsurers come together and agree this is the kind of uh, package that we're going to give our customers to cover against the new peril that has come into our lives and which is the pandemic or communicable diseases. So for now, it's treated as an exclusion. Um, business interruption policies will, will respond if if a fire or any other uh, covered peril in your material damage policy will, will, will happen and a loss occurs and it's admissible. Um, so for me, Rosa, the future is, is yet to be defined in, in terms of the coverage that we are going yeah. to have. Okay. All right. Um, Caroline, thank you for your response and for uh, being honest that the time to remodel some of these policies has come and to make them very exclusive. If BI was a standalone policy business interruption, then I think there's a lot of the general insuring, insuring public that would benefit um, during this period. Yes. Walter, do you have any views on this? Uh, thank you, Rosalind. Uh, the, the tricky bit of uh, the situation in which we are is that uh, we, some of the businesses have been forced into closure by the government. And uh, most Kenyan policies, uh, uh, most policies that I know of exclude actions by the government because you don't have any control about them. Uh, that makes it even a little bit more tricky than if you want to remodel them in the, in, in the future. Uh, government action is, ensuring against government action can be a tricky bit. But I, I know, uh, and I think maybe the, the, the panelists uh, probably have also come across this. In Europe, we are beginning to see a bit of class action. What happened is that some uh, insurance companies there uh, went ahead to expressly exclude, um, exclude pandemics. But 
they cleverly they, uh, reintroduced uh, sublimits on government forced government closure. Now we have had both, so uh, that has led to uh, quite a bit of challenge because that, those policies seem to be contradictory. And we all know that uh, when uh, you construct a policy which is contradictory, then it is construed against the person who, uh, who drew the policy. So we may be seeing unprecedented class action uh, happening in some jurisdictions in Europe. But in Kenya, uh, I do not know how, as an industry, we are going to respond to the issues around uh, when we have a pandemic, like, an issue like this. But it's also coupled by the fact that the government has got involved and said, look, guys, uh, we cannot do X, Y, Z. Uh, it, it, it's going to be an interesting future, uh, even if we are going to wear our thinking innova uh, uh, innovative caps. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, um, I'm going to give this final one to you, Sandeep, as we get into the poll session. Uh, so working from home does mean that a lot of business premises have been left unattended and unoccupied for extended periods of time. What would happen if there was a break-in and I lose equipment or goods in the process? Okay, um, now, uh, again, uh, this is a situation where, uh, you know, what I can tell from my experience, uh, most of the offices are not fully unoccupied. So there has been most of the businesses, uh, you know, they have been, uh, especially I'm talking in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a Kenyan context, because yeah. most of the companies have implemented rota system. Now, the thing is that, uh, uh, you know, when a business premise is unoccupied, uh, it has security measures, which we assume it has. And that is one of the criteria we, during the underwriting of the policy, we look into it. So if it has full uh, protected, uh, you know, uh, as uh, yeah, declared security measures, and if there is a break in during that period, it is payable. Unless and until uh, uh, the risk goes on uh, on a silent basis. So when a risk goes on silent basis, there are certain conditions which kick in. So the risk has to be reassessed. Uh, and then uh, actually the policy has to be recalibrated. But from my experience, what I have seen, including our office, we have been operating on Rota system, our office, and most of the offices have, uh, or premises, I would say, has not been fully unoccupied. All right. Um, Caroline, what do you have to say about that? So what are some of the three things that policyholders have to look out for or have to do to ensure that should they have um, a claim that just arises from um, lack of occupancy of office, then they would actually uh, get they would get their claim settled. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we we always try to tell customers is to behave as though they are not insured. That should be one of the rallying calls that I'll make here. Try and behave yeah. as if you're not insured. So um, when you realize that uh, you are out of occupation in terms of your premises and uh, you are perhaps operating away from the premises, you are expected to at least uh, notify your, your insurance uh, company, like uh, Sandeep has just said. Please notify mm -hmm. your broker and ensure that that information reaches the insurance company so that everybody knows you're closed out and uh, you are looking at a particular period when you'll be closed. But then have measures, especially um, uh, occasionally or have a, a regular program of attending to the premises so that the premises do not remain unattended. Now, I, I, it would also be important to ensure that there's um, a, a assurance of security around the premises so that then should anything happen, then there's a report of the same. Things happen uh, when, when people are out of office. Uh, an electric fault could occur. Uh, you've not been in this office for so long. Perhaps there's yeah. been a water leakage. Um, there's damage in there. Your records could be getting spoiled. I mean, very many things could happen to, to a building. Like, like now it's raining, there could be leakage through the roof, then you get flooded, and then because nobody um, is, is around the premises and there's no regular inspection of the premises, you have a problem when you put in a, your claim. Now, when you report a claim, you also have to be definite in time and uh, place when, when a loss occurs uh, for us to, to be able to quantify and to identify the period that caused the loss or rather the cause of the loss. 
So it, it's important to keep, to, to keep um, uh, in contact with your premises. And if it's completely impossible, for instance, if you're locked up in Nairobi and your premises are in Nakuru, then have some arrangement with, with someone around Nakuru who can um, just keep checking on your premises, but ensure that you are in touch with your property. Please behave as though you are not insured. Now for, for domestic uh, package holders, then what we advise is that uh, cover ceases to operate upon a cessation of 30 days, uh, rather the expiry of 30 days um, on the building section of the, of the cover. So it's important to notify um, your underwriter when you're away from the premises for an extended period of time. Uh, and then they will endorse the policy to note that uh, you are not occupying and there's an increased risk of anything okay. happening. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that response. We will now um, take a 60 second poll that will lead us into the next segment. All right, so we are sharing the poll results. 56% of the people are not um, certain about cyber risk, uh, followed by 26 who have a cyber insurance policy in place. That's an impressive number. 10% say that this is currently not a priority for the organization and they don't intend on purchasing such a policy. And 8% would like to purchase a cyber insurance policy in the next six months. Right? So a lot of surveys that have been carried out have named cyber security as one of the most dangerous emerging risks. It ranks highly right next to risks such as climate change and the internet of things. So Walter, I would like us to begin by demystifying cyber security, because a lot of us believe that this is a risk that touches on large organizations and multinationals, and it does not affect um, small medium enterprises. Yet several companies have been directing large numbers of employees to work from home, um, and, and mostly because of the pandemic. So the question as to how secure the company data is with the increased remote networks, for example, the public Wi-Fi, have come into question. So Saiba, um, sorry, Walter, I'd like you to take that. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, the, 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 the problem we have is that we think, like you've rightly said, that uh, this is a risk that uh, is, you know, big corporates and multinationals are the ones who are exposed to cyber risks. Yeah. The truth is that it is as close as we all are with our cell phones. That is uh, how close we are with cyber risks. And again, many people think that uh, it, it, it affects other people. You don't see it affecting you, but I can tell you uh, we are all exposed to cyber risks. And if I come to your question about using public um, uh, internet connectivity or Wi-Fi, 
they, in my opinion, are extremely, extremely uh, insecure. And you can easily, uh, you can easily, as somebody who is working, uh, using, because these days we, uh, most of, uh, most em employers encourage their staff to bring their own devices. And so they probably have brought their own, you know, their own laptops to work, uh, or they have probably brought their own tabs or their own phones that they actually use for, for leisure, but they also use it for business. And uh, connecting to company uh, yeah, information using public Wi-Fi is one of the things that as far as possible, uh, employees should desist from because it exposes the company in, in a way that you cannot imagine. Uh, let me give you an example. What I think as uh, most panelists may have uh, read in the media in Kenya, uh, uh, you know, because of uh, what is happening now, most schools, particularly private schools, have started now uh, offering tuition, online tuition. But I believe many of you uh, already know that uh, there are one or two schools uh, who's, you know, uh, who have been attacked mm -hmm. and. Uh, Somebody has, uh, or some people have maliciously, uh, you know, posted um, material which I think is pornography uh, in some of those, you know, so that is a typical cyber attack. So when we talk about uh, cyber attack, do not, for one, think that it is going to affect companies, multinationals, or that kind of a thing. It will affect uh, you as an individual, even on your cell phone. So my advice is, if you are operating, and nobody today operates without uh, connecting one way or the other to a digital gadget. If I were you, uh, you should not uh, actually leave your, in your risk, uh, list of risks that you want to ensure, you should consider cyber on a very serious note because the exposure to cyber, particularly now that we have been driven out of the offices and been asked to work from home out of necessity, we must, as a matter of uh, survival, think about cyber uh, exposure and cyber, cyber risks and cyber insurance. All right, so what happened with uh, one of our schools was very unfortunate. That was a very unfortunate incident, as you have mentioned, Walter where they had pornographic material interrupting their normal school session. So uh, Caroline, in that case, for this particular school, how would cyber security insurance have responded to this situation? And what kind of risks, in addition to um, uh, traumatizing the children, what, what other risks do they face? Do they face a potential risk of being sued by the parents? Or not be or being accused of not being adequately prepared or having the right security. We can take this as a case study and ask ourselves how would this school have positioned themselves adequately just to make sure that they're adequately covered. Um, thank you, Rosa. And uh, yes, I agree with uh, Walter that uh, these are risks that is real and uh, living with us now, including anybody who has a smart, a smart gadget. Um, so for the particular school, um, they certainly are that party liability. Uh, so I'll just take um, us through what, what cyber insurance is about. So other than um, the usual uh, ransomware that could be asked by cyber attackers, there is also what we call the first party loss, which is your own loss. You will get a business interrupted should you have uh, uh, a cyber attack because you've got to shut down your systems just to make sure that there's a cleanup. Uh, maybe your data has been taken hostage by the cyber attackers and you've got to recover the data by paying ransom in some countries. It's, it's illegal in others, it's paid. Uh, and then there is of course that party liability. Remember there's data yeah. privacy and there is also the leakage of data that, that, that could happen having had a, uh, a cyber attack scenario. So in this mm -hmm. particular school, what, what parents are likely to come up with, and I hope I'm not speaking to any parents in this, in this uh, <laughs> session to give them ideas, is that uh, the school is likely to face uh, that party liability uh, claims in terms of parents coming forward and saying the school was negligent. 
they didn't yes. have maybe the correct spyware, malware, antivirus, or whatever pro data protection uh, and uh, access protocols that uh, are supposed to be in place before such a program runs. And for sure, if that 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 happened, and because pornographic uh, material would be heavy, and for it to happen, then it means some protocols were breached or they were not in place, and the, something really went wrong. So that's that's one element that they are likely to face. Now, if they have a cyber insurance. Uh, policy, what the policy will be looking to do is then, of course, defend them, pay the cost for uh, whatever the courts may determine in future. Uh, and I'm just giving a scenario, should it be determined that they were negligent, then if negligence come in, then that's when the, the party liability claims would be payable. So yes, there is a, a scenario they are looking at, and there's a potential of uh, the party uh, claims erupting, especially from parents. The other interesting angle that's coming out is, is the exposure of children to such material. Now, um, uh, I, I don't think we've seen any case go through the courts in Kenya. I'm not familiar with any. Um, so we'll, be, we'll all be looking out to see what really happens um, in determining any case that could be uh, coming forward, especially in terms of the reputation and the kind of uh, information children have been exposed to prematurely, them being kids and uh, adults having been in control of the station that was going on. Um, I think that's what I would respond to right away. All right, thank you, Caroline. Um, Sandy, um, another area of cyber risk uh, would affect a lot of organizations because of remote working. So some employees have lost, um, have contributed to loss of data and breach of data unintentionally. Would cyber risk policy cover such a risk? Okay, um, that depends on the, uh, you know, uh, what is typically called an insider job in terms of data leaks. So there are some cyber policies which actually cover that. And uh, if you take, especially when it comes to financial institutions and in uh, some BBP policies, they do have this, uh, uh, you know, what is called an internal manipulation of data. So yeah. that in some aspects in some BBB policies, not all, depending on the price and the you know configuration of the policies, what you have, it is covered. Now here actually in terms of, uh, you know, I, I'll go back to uh, your earlier question in terms of uh, what as an individual, uh, what is the primary risk you face? Uh, in case, uh, you know, there are two kinds of risk which happen, which uh, we foresee is suppose if you have a BOID policy in your office, and now your personal device is latched on to the uh, to the company network, and that is uh, you know is subject to a cyber attack. Then one of the things which you as an individual can face is identity theft. You know, yeah. so your identity because mm -hmm. uh, when you have a cyber attack such that you know, but the company passwords, individual uh, uh, because you see you are logging into your uh, uh, device as an administrator. So anybody who is attacking your network actually gets into your administrative data. So identity theft, that has got very large implications. Uh, uh, so in terms of uh, manipulation of your individual records, you uh, individually being uh, subjected to ransomware, uh, then targeted uh, phishing uh, emails, uh, and then uh, there is another point. Uh, when we generally talk about uh, cybersecurity, we generally think about banks and others, uh, you know, typical institutions. But if you see the data globally available, 40% of the cyber attacks are on industrial institutions. In fact, as we speak, I think yesterday, Honda's plant all over the world has been shut down due to a ransomware. So I think, you know, working from home because i have seen you know in terms especially on remote monitoring uh, people have been given access on their own devices working from remote places wherein they are actually logging on to the industrial network you know monitoring and stuff uh, that actually especially at uh, industrial clients so this is a segment which we do not talk about like how can a manufacturing, uh, we just, we, when, we, we, when we just think about a manufacturing or an SME organization, we generally think of some mechanical machines running, but that is not the case. There's a huge amount of automation over the period of time, which has taken place, uh, especially if a, if a company, which is a multinational company has uh, multiple plants running at multiple uh, places, they generally have a central monitoring uh, system. 
and uh, that's where the attack take place. Uh, so uh, this is something uh, you know uh, through your, uh, uh, your platform. I would like to convey to all the brokers and clients to have a much deeper look, especially if you have SME and manufacturing uh, clients uh, in your uh, clientele. So uh, that's something. Correct. And another thing is that whenever you are actually enabling a remote monitoring, uh, the, the organization must must be very sure that they have, you know, virtual quarantining, uh, quarantining uh, facilities. Suppose if a server is getting affected, so virtually can you quarantine that particular server or, uh, or very, uh, if these particular threat perceptions have not been taken care of, then I think you are very much exposed that uh, Walter had earlier mentioned. All right, thank you, Sandeep, for that. We can close off this segment, Walter, before we get into the survey by giving us a couple of things that you'd consider as mitigating measures, uh, what most people have called cyber hygiene practices that should be followed by individuals who are working remotely. Uh, I think one of the most important things is that uh, one, uh, people who are uh, working remotely uh, need to ensure that uh, they connect uh, using company authorized means they should actually desist as far as possible from connecting uh, through uh, uh, a public Wi-Fi, very, very dangerous. Uh, I think companies need to increasingly uh, encourage uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, the, the level of security is, is, is a lot a lot higher, uh, although I would, I would want to believe that there is no system that is absolutely uh, foolproof from being hacked. Uh, you know, these, these, these hackers, they're in business, and so uh, every uh, person in business always thinks ahead. And even as you try to bring, uh, to, 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 to to bring as much security around your systems as you possibly think, uh, they will still find ways of uh, making sure that they, 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 they breach your security. And remember that our systems are also developed by human beings. And it is not a wonder that the same, same people who are developing our systems are the same people who are designing ways, uh, you know, what what is... Uh, loosely called uh, backdoor. They create a backdoor through which they can come through your system. So th those are happening, but uh, it's, it's important, very, very important to, to make sure that uh, you have, uh, just not having a cyber policy in place, but making sure that uh, the staff are disciplined and staff are prone to forgetfulness. So we need to always remind them uh, periodically that they need to make sure that uh, Things as, as 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 mundane as making sure that they log off from you know after you know a, a day's work. I have worked in a situation where uh, the IT guy goes around after everybody goes home, and uh, you would be surprised at how many laptops he finds that are still left. You know, uh, people have not logged uh, out, and as, as basic as that may be, uh, it it helps quite a bit. Uh, people who, if, if you give staff um, guidance to carry home, they should make sure that they, you know, they, they protect it the same way they protect their wallets. If you leave your laptop uh, exposed at the back of your car, you can almost guess what will happen to it. Yeah. If yeah. you carelessly talk on your phone uh, on River Road, not because River Road is a bad place, but you know what you're likely supposed to be exposed to. So some of those you know, um, obvious measures will go a long way in making sure that you operate in a fairly safe cyber space. All right, thank you, Walter. We'll now take the survey as we get into the last segment.
Is that? Mm -hmm. All right, so the poll results from these last uh, questions. A good number of people have home insurance policies in place. That is very good. And um, an equally good number of people are saying that they are not interested in getting one. <laughs> and 7% do not have one. So working from home does come with its own risk exposures. And we have a lot of employees who have complained about the blood working hours. A good number of organizations have had to come up with the guidelines of working from home. Some have gone as far as purchasing workstations for their staff to enable them work from home comfortably. So in this segment, because we have sort of run out of time in 30 seconds, I will allow each of you to just let us know how the WIBA and the employees liability policies would respond to, would respond in these situations um, because a lot of employers, employees are employing the working from home protocols. No more than 30 seconds, please. Okay, right. Caroline. Uh, let, let me tell, uh, okay. go first, uh, Rosalind. That's fine. Well, um, I think because if you have allowed your employees to work from home and WIVA mm -hmm. is supposed to cover uh, risks that are attached to uh, work uh, situation, working hours, then the WIVA, in the event of there being an incident, WIVA will respond. So uh, I am encouraging everybody who has got uh, people working from home to make sure that their WIVA is in place. I understand that there are companies, employers that are already canceling their waiver policies. That is extremely dangerous. All right. Okay, thanks, Walter. Caroline? Yeah, I can only agree with Walter and also say that uh, certainly uh, employers need to be careful around employees working from home because the policy covers uh, employees uh, on anything arising out of and in connection with and within the scope of their work. So if you send me to work from home, I will easily put in a claim, go to court, sue you, and the courts are quite pro-employees. So they, they will get their awards given to them. And it, it's, it's really difficult to tell whether it was lunchtime and I was making lunch or I was working. So yeah. anything is possible yeah. and you're not really in full view of what I'm doing physically. So please have your Weber policies in place. The policy extends to cover that as long as they are working and it's in pursuit of your business that they are at home. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Caroline. Sandeep? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, already Walter and Caroline had added. I would like to, uh, in fact, I was just checking some of the questions. Uh, I think there was a question on uh, WIBA and COVID. I would like to tackle it from, uh, it from that angle. So if it is okay with you. That's fine. Okay, so basically, uh, you know, in terms of said, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, per thing which is originating within the scope of work is covered under a, a WIBA policy. However, our WIBA policy actually has one major exclusion, uh, that is an occupation disease which is defined what kind of occupation disease is excluded. Now, the other section which talks about other occupation disease is actually uh, very uh, ambiguous on what exactly it means. Now, when it comes to a COVID kind of a situation, uh, you know, it has to be specifically proof that the COVID transmission was particularly in result uh, of the exposure in occupation to, you know, COVID. So the transmission was not incidental, but particular to the nature of his or her job. So in only that case, uh, a WIBA policy would respond in terms of COVID. So now again, it, 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 in most of the cases, it will go into arbitration, what we uh, assume. So now uh, again, uh, there is this thing. Now there is another angle of employer's liability. Now here, the situation becomes a little bit dicey because uh, when you're working from home, uh, duty of care, where does it come? Who is in control of the premises and who, under whose purview the duty of care comes in? So, you know, that, that, that thing becomes, as we said, it's a dicey situation, a little bit unprecedented situation. So these are some things I think will require some court decision to set precedence. All right. Thank you so much, Sandeep. 
Um, we only have a couple of minutes before the end of this session. So I will give you an opportunity to give your closing remarks in no more than 30 seconds, and then I will conclude. Thank you. Uh, Walter, we could start with you. Uh, thank you, Rosaline. Uh, thank you for the fellow, uh, to the fellow panelists and also to uh, the audience listening to us out there. Uh, well, I would just want to say that, uh, you know, every, like I said earlier, every cloud has a silver lining. And I think uh, COVID is teaching us things that we may have been slow in embracing. For a long time, uh, most employers have been talking about uh, flexi working hours, that you could choose to work from home or work from the office because many of us prefer to go to the office. You wake up at five, uh, you take four hours of traffic, you arrive in the office tired, and yet you could have been able to do more productive work while at home, you know, in that space of two or three hours. So I think I'm glad that, uh, you know, COVID is now forcing this on us, uh, that we may have to accept the new reality that uh, uh, being in the office from eight to five is, you know, you can transfer the office to, you know, to, to your home and you can still do very productive work without necessarily getting involved in issues to do with traffic jam. So let's, as, as a country, uh, as, as, as an industry, embrace this new normal. It looks like it is a disruption, but I think it's just teaching us that time is up, that we need to do things differently. Thank you. All right, thank you, Walter. Caroline? Yeah, thank you, Rosa. It was quite nice um, having us as panelists, and I hope we've caused some uh, information to filter into the insuring public. What I'll, I'll advise uh, the listeners is that uh, please, um, read your policies carefully, um, behave as though you're not insured, keep communicating to your insurance broker or agent and the insurance company, keep them updated about what's happening, make inquiries. And for the policies that we've discussed here, they are all very, very vital for you in this period of the pandemic, especially your WIBA, your cyber and your liability policies. Uh, not forgetting, of course, all the aspects of negligence, the duty of care, the breach and the losses that come out of that. So uh, keep at it. Please do not cancel your policies. You need them most now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Sandeep? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Rosa, for the invitation and all the uh, panelists and plus all the other joinees uh, in this particular platform. Uh, you know, uh, this uh, situation has forced us to uh, think of insurance uh, and navigating it in a very different way. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we need to think in terms of uh, how we are going to in use insurance as a tool of risk mitigation, because the kind of challenges that you face, uh, you know, uh, this is a situation where we are specifically talking about cash flow crunch uh, as because of supply chain disruptions and uh, the disruptions and uh, manufacturing and other, uh, you know, uh, demand side issues. So insurance becomes a very good source of risk transfer and providing you the cash when it is necessary. So if you are cu cutting down on insurance cost or reducing the cover, it would be detrimental. So uh, to all the uh, consumers here and all the brokers here, I would urge you that you advise the same uh, for yourself uh, to your companies as well as to your clients. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sandeep. In conclusion, thank you very much, Walter, Caroline and Sandeep for making time to be here today. Um, thank you to the attendees of this webinar for just taking time out for this. We really do appreciate at Zamara. A couple of things that I would like to say is that we want to move from evidence to action. And how we will do this is that we, we, we would like to conduct what we would call a free consultation on your policies. So we will be able to identify um, any gaps on cover, we'll be able to pick out anything that would be seen as duplication of cover, and we'll also give you the tricks and the hacks of saving money. So please reach out to us. We will leave a number on the screen. I also do want to reiterate that in case you're unable to attend the entire session or you want to go through this session again with your teams uh, or you would relish re-watching it, we'd like you to uh, we'd like you to know that we will share uh, this 
uh, this recording on YouTube in the next 48 hours. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.